Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we are going to be talking about advances in technology for data infrastructure, everything from the telemetry to data warehouse and visualization. Further, we'll discuss some of the key data applications that are enabled by some of these new technologies and new capabilities. We'll talk about things like how are things done today versus, say, five years ago? What are some of the biggest tech advances that game studios should be aware of? And to speak to all of these issues, we have, first of all, Andre Cohen, head of data science at mobile game publisher Tilting Point. Second, we have Gaurav Gupta, partner at Lightspeed Venture Partners, for, former VP of product at both Splunk and Elastic, and current board member at Grafana. And finally, we have Oliver Loeffler, former CTO of Calibri Games, the creators of games such as Idle Miner Tycoon and Idle Factory Tycoon. And Oliver, I know you've recently had a change, uh, having left Calibri, Calibri very recently. Can you speak a little bit about what you are currently working on? Yeah, so, so maybe a small recap. So we, we as founders, uh, we sold the majority of our, our shares of Colibri to, to Ubisoft uh, last year. And then we kind of set ourselves a free premium goal. First is like to establish a great leadership team um, to, to start, um, second to start a new games machinery so that we are able to, to build also new games. And third, actually to transition Colibri to, to a data-driven uh, culture, um, something we can also talk a little bit in here. And we had achieved these goals um, in the beginning of this year, and then we decided it was a good time to, to leave the company. Um, so we as founders are now transitioned out like since April, and uh, we will now focus a little bit more on, um, on together, like investing into different assets like stocks, funds, but also looking into some more angel investments and, and, and crypto, for example, um, and also like taking some time to, to disconnect a little bit and to get a clear thoughts again, maybe see like what, what the future brings. And Gaurav, I know you, you, you've been investing in a lot of these uh, data infrastructure types of companies. Is there, is there anything, any companies we should be aware of outside of some of the, the main ones we'll be talking about? Yeah, um, so uh, maybe maybe I'll just give you some quick context. Uh, uh, so yeah. uh, Lightspeed, uh, the firm I work at, is a, is a global firm. We invest across stages and we invest across everything, uh, enterprise, consumer, healthcare. Right. In fact, we've done a bunch of gaming investments. Um, uh, I personally am on the infrastructure side uh, and have interacted with, with uh, gaming companies for a while now. In particular, like Lightspeed. So uh, you mentioned Grafana, the company I'm involved with. We've got a bunch of other ones. Uh, um, uh, Matillion is a company that sits on top of uh, Snowflake and, and does a bunch of you know, ELT type operations, data transformation operations that, that'd be interesting. Uh, Materialize is a streaming analytics company that we're involved with. Um, and uh, Dremio is another company that, that could be interesting. That's a SQL query engine that lets you query data from many uh, data sources. So those are some examples of the companies that uh, the firm's involved with. Right. Andre, any interesting news from Tilting Point before we jump in as well? No, I think we're we're still growing and we've actually figured out, you know, that the data platform, which is relevant to this, is the is basically the key to managing games, uh, especially like in the in the breadth of it. So we're doubling down even further this year into how to do this kind of stuff. Um, Specific because there's so many variations of service providers today that we just have to take into everything into account. So uh, yeah, we're we're growing uh, very fast uh, and getting more games uh, that are all different. Right. And speaking to the data platform, I thought we could start by talking about some of the the new applications. So for free to play game studios trying to gain competitive advantage, we've seen a lot of new capabilities arise, whether it's from Snowflake or Grafana or the other companies like that. And so what are some of the key applications in terms of whether it's you know, from a data warehousing perspective or visualization or analytics that enables free to play game studios to become more competitive and to you know, be, be a better, stronger free to play game studio? Um, and maybe Andre, starting with you, since you're you're in the thick of it. Yeah, sure. I mean, the the one of the, the hardest things for free to play now with so many services is combining all the data together. Um, and we have a huge team to combine that data. Um, and how you do it, it's like that's where Snowflake comes in, and that's where visualization comes in later. But just getting the data in is extremely difficult. 
uh, the more games you have or the more things you're trying to optimize, the, the harder it is, right? Um, how many ad networks are you advertising in, for instance? Um, if you decide to switch from one MMP to another, that's a ho whole world of problems. Uh, if you are interested in conversion values on Apple, that's a whole other pipeline that you have to start researching and there's no documentation. Um, so that to us is really, really like a, a technology that's coming up now. Um, there were used to be ways of doing it before. Now there's ways that are easier sometimes, like there's drag and drop ways of doing it even, but it's still the early days. Um, I don't know about you, Oliver, maybe you, like, how do you see the data problem as like a single or two or three games developer? Yeah, yeah, sure. We have like, uh, like, um, well, Colibri has it like a little bit easier since like we can basically control like what tech the games integrate and can can basically um, uh, make use of the same ad networks and so on and so on uh, and so on and so forth um, from from the data side. But it's still like always like a, a challenge like to to normalize the data or kind of get it on the same level. So uh, you get like an KPI from from that um, API and you get like another KPI from another API um, and they're maybe meaning the same thing, but they're slightly different or slightly differently like defined. And then you sometimes need to combine this data together in order to make, make real use of it. But that, that's, that's like often a challenge to, to do that if you have like a lot of, lot of different uh, data sources. So um, there, I think this will always be a challenge, but I think like at least like data uh, infrastructure can at least help and and kind of get this data in into one place and then you can work with it more easily. You can transform it, can, you can clean it and so on and so forth. So um, uh, these, these things can help, of course. Well, so it sounds like some of this technology may be useful for data standardization, but are, are there is there anything in particular, like for example, as far as like capabilities or ways to ha have competitive advantage? It sounds like, you know, getting KPIs and aggregating different types of data is one thing, but are there any more, you know, some of the fancy pants stuff you guys might be doing at Tilting Point, Andre, is <laughs> like, I, I know we, we've talked before about user journeys, things like that, but are there any specific applications that you can think of that free-to-play game studios should be looking at increasingly in the future that might now be enabled by some of this new data infrastructure and capabilities that, that are coming online? Yeah, I mean, I think we're entering a phase where uh, there's a lot of SaaS service providers out there that can do things that before used to be require a full data science team, right? So there is like a, a startup now called Pacan. They do LTV, but they sit on top of all this infrastructure of Snowflake or Databricks and whatever you want. And that's really cool. Like it, it makes it turnkey solution for a, a problem that everyone has, LTV. Uh, it makes you ahead of the curve if you for the people that don't have that kind of technology. So it's kind of neat. Um, and we have the same thing that we are spending a lot of time as data quality. So like, are you getting data into your system? Did, did you receive as much data as you expected? Are the country codes making sense in the data as Oliver said, right? Normalization and cleaning up. Um, and there's another service for that. I think it's called Monte Carlo. And again, turnkey solution. Uh, you no longer have to think about all this stuff. And I mean, uh, Guarav, I mean, you you even mentioned um, Grafana, right? Um, I think one of the cool things there is now there's more and more plugins. So you can plug in data sources from different places and monitor it, uh, which is something that we think is, how often have I seen, you know, someone starts an A-B test and then only two weeks later do they realize, oh crap, the data we're receiving is not correct. We can't finish the AV test because we never validated the data in the first place. Um, so that's, I think, where monitoring really comes in. And that's all new. I mean, I think that 10 years ago, this was not, we weren't there yet. Just getting data was enough of a challenge. Yeah, I'll add, I mean, um, you know, 10, 10 uh, almost uh, 15 years ago, you know, when I, when I was at Swank, we were actually our first, our first large customer was uh, Zynga. I think it was our first seven figure customer. Like gaming was always on the cutting edge of using data. But for many years, it was really centered around what we now call observability, right? Which is just like, make sure the game's up, make sure it's scaling. And then, 
in the early days, actually, the most cutting edge companies started to do some analytics because effectively what they were doing, they were uh, observability contains logs, traces, and metrics about the game. And so they were dumping all these things into systems like Splunk and uh, you know, eventually Elastic, mostly to keep the game up and running. Um, uh, but over time, they sort of realized that they could actually get a lot of analytics out of it. And you know, the use cases that, I, I mean, it, it's just gotten more sophisticated over time, but it's really about kind of optimizing and personalizing the game to, to the user, right? And so that might be something like, you know, forecasting what a player might do based on what they've done before, and then, you know, changing how the game works to, to improve the, the customer experience somehow, or, you know, targeting ads or marketing, you know, really effectively down to the individual user, right? You know, based on what they've done. Um, and so, I mean, that stuff is extremely powerful and is, is basically the edge that a lot of these gaming providers can have to one, you know, increase, increase retention, but also monetize better. And so I think that's driving everyone to, to, to put this data at the same time, the games have gotten more complex. So the observability problem is still there in spades, right? Um, because you've now got these global games, <laughs> you know, across the world, you know, millions and millions of users. Um, so you've got the the the, the 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 scaling issues, and then you've got all this need and desire to personalize and optimize the game. And I think both of those things have now converged. Where I think gaming companies are almost like data companies. They have so many data science engineers these days. So, yeah. So, so I also think like in, especially in the last years, like there there was like a big shift into going away from only the observability to also playing back. Um, so I think like um, there was like a lot of advances in, in, the, in the last ten years where you can more easily like get data from the game, store it somewhere, and then visualize it. But I think now is the time where, where it's kind of getting into a circle. So not just a one-way street, but rather like going from the insights you generate or from the data you, you have in your data warehouse, going back to the game or play it back to the game. And then it's kind of gets gets to a circle. And that's that's where things like, uh, what do you mention? Like predictions, recommendations, target personalization uh, of the game uh, becomes more and more uh, important now. Right. And so maybe if I were to think at a high level, some of what's being enabled might be capabilities. It might also be cost. It may also be switching, like being able to, to, to the example that you mentioned earlier, Andre, like right now a big deal is on the MMP side, right? Like as when, you know, App Love <laughs> acquires a Just or, you know, as Zynga acquires somebody else, then it's like, oh, maybe we want to switch now for competitive reasons or things of that nature. And so, Talking about some of the companies and, and the companies that I'm hearing more and more about are companies like Snowflake and Grafana, but maybe we could speak to some of those capabilities as far as what they enable and, and maybe the specific companies that some of the free-to-play games companies that are watching this video might need to be aware of. And maybe we could start with Snowflake, like some of what I've been reading about in terms of materialized views, the potential to store unstructured data in an efficient way and things like that. Could you guys speak to not only Snowflake, but some of the other companies and what are the specific things that these companies enabled that we should be aware of? And, and maybe Gaurav, we could start with you since you're you're in the thick of, uh, sure. thick of this, as well as sitting on the board of some of these companies. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I mean, data warehouses. Um, so the, the Snowflake's in sort of a category of data warehouses. They 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 call OLAP, um, and they've been around for a long time. Now, traditionally, they've been slow. They've been hard to operate. They haven't been very flexible. And um, Snowflake really just kind of revamped the whole thing. They they did this thing where they separated compute and storage, which allowed these things to really scale very easily. They put it all in the cloud so you don't have to manage these data warehouses and they leveraged kind of the cheap storage that you can get from uh, guys like Amazon and Google and Microsoft. And so it really, you know, really what that means is that, you know, a small gaming studio can afford to store all this data and can, can use it. Now, the other thing they did is like, you've always been able to take 
lots of telemetry and stick it in a on some storage somewhere, right? But then I, I think I, I think we were talking about before to actually take that messy data, you know, munge it, process it, create a schema, do a whole bunch of stuff was a huge amount of work, and so nobody was doing that. W what's happening now is that developers are a lot smarter about how they write data to a database, and so they're able to write that data to something like Snowflake. Uh, ideally, they put some schema around it. And the beauty of something like Snowflake is that they can then use just plain old SQL to query it, right? Versus like back in the day, they were sticking it in Hadoop uh, uh, or, or just plain S3 and developers had to learn a whole new language to start to query the data. So those are some of the innovations that it's enabled. Uh, I will say though that Snowflake Snowflake remains a batch system, right? It's not really real time. Although I think you know things like materialized views helps improve how queries uh, perform. But you know fundamentally, you take the data. There's a delay. It goes into Snowflake. Actually, a lot of people do. You can do transformation inside of Snowflake even further. It's called something called ELT, extract, load, transform. Um, but it's it's a batch process, meaning it doesn't necessarily enable real time you know, gaming operations. So it's, there's a whole set of interesting use cases around analytics of games, uh, maybe even doing some predictive modeling, um, but the, the real-time aspects are probably still done by other tools. So I'll stop there, I'll let these other guys jump in. They have thoughts. Yeah, yeah so, so I agree. I think like um, uh, if you compare it to like, to, to a normal like database, I think, it's, there's a lot of things which, for example, Snowflake improves. Of course, first it's in OLAP service. So I think like okay, crunching a lot of data is much more performant. And I think Snowflake in general really does, does a really good job there in like kind of optimizing your queries for you. Don't need to worry about any setting any indices and, and, and these kind of things what you would need to do in, in other databases. So they kind of take off a lot of like the, the work of a database administrator for example and and just like get it get it for you and i think like there this this really like helped at colibri uh, uh, back then when we we switched over to to snowflake so that we can just store all the data and can query it in, in a quite performant and, and easy way and um so i think what's very really cool is like that you have like also like the structured and unstructured or semi-structured data so you can dump in your raw json in there and then kind of um, do another layer, which kind of is a clean layer, and then another layer, which is more like for transformations and aggregations, you can do it all in one spot. You don't need any other storage, like another blob storage or data lake or something like that. Uh, so you can have it everything in one place. And I think this makes things a lot easier. I think um, multi-tenancy support, something that you also mentioned, like separation of, of storage in, in compute is, is really cool so that you can, um, basically have like different clusters of compute units kind of operating on your data, which don't influence each other. Um, so you can have like one, one cluster kind of for your dashboards, um, which, which should always be running. And if people like kind of want to look at data, um, it, it shouldn't be influenced when like, for example, like an analyst doing some heavy queries on, on the same data. Um, so that's, that's really cool. And I think also like the scalability and, and the cost side is, 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 is also an important thing which Snowflake improves. So you can basically spin up like a stronger cluster or a, a kind of compute unit in, in seconds. So if you need to do some heavy queries, you can just like scale up your, your computation, um, do your queries and then scale it down in, in a second. Uh, you can also like uh, write some scripts that for example, during working hours, um, you have like more compute uh, and and when everyone kind of goes to sleep and the data is not really touched, uh, you can shut down like most of your computer units and therefore save costs. And I think these these are a lot of things uh, which which Snowflakes enables and kind of makes makes the life easier and and less costly for for a lot of game developers. Yeah, I mean the tilting point has a lot of the same things in the sense of we I mean from a day to day actually real time is not not necessary, I find, um, because, I mean, there's always monitoring that you can use, but also if you really want to make a, a, a complex query, it's not, it's in batch, as you said, Rob. And so <laughs> it, it, uh, it doesn't have to be every second that it gets updated. 
Um, and big decisions don't get made on the fly at 3 p.m. on an afternoon after, you know, something happened. Um, the, what I find a lot, and that's what we were scaling at Tilting Point, is that we, yes, we like, as you said, Oliver, like the interactive cluster, a cluster that's just for dedicated for BI analysts to do queries ad hoc um, is like the thing that we look a lot now. And the more we give people access to the data, the more we are reconsidering how we're storing data and how we're transforming the data um, and also even the service providers in some ways. Um, the, it's amazing how many people I think by the, in the 21st century are capable BI analysts. Um, I think they all got trained by the school of Excel and by now everyone is an expert at pivot tables. And um, that's actually pushing us along really fast um, into a new direction of it's not just, you know, blobs of JSON. Like in 10 years ago, we were talking about blobs of JSON. People would get CSV files of the, from the BI analyst. And now the expectation is uh, pretty graphs uh, of real-time data from yesterday um, using, you know, as much data as you want. Because I think that's the big change also recently is data is pretty cheap. Um, I don't think that's the limiting factor for, for a publisher. If you have a successful game, uh, if you if the game is not successful, the cost is still prohibited. Yeah. But if you, uh, all right. Let, can we talk a little bit about why what, what where where Snowflake is not so great? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> where let's I think it's headed because I see this in other industries. So, like one, you know, Snowflake's sort of an interesting concept, right? It's actually really cheap to store the data. They basically price it the same as Amazon S three, like optic storage, right? But it's pretty expensive to query it. Right, and what they basically say is just stick all your data in and actually do all the transformation and querying inside Snowflake, which creates an enormous bill, right? And I think there's this, I think it's like, I, I think it's, we, we all want to find one solution to stick all the data in, but if you go back in the time of history, there's never been one solution, right? There's always a, a, a more real-time product or a more elegant product or a more efficient product to handle a certain kind of data workload. So, you know, I think, you know, uh, S Snowflake has built a wonderful product, but you're starting to see some of the data lake architectures catch up, right? Some of the stuff like, if you're not going to use Snowflake, I think a lot of people right now are using some combination of, you know, Airflow plus Python to do the ETL, and then they're storing it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a data lake like S3, or they're using Databricks. These technologies, which I think are alternative to using Snowflake, while technically, I think much more challenging for your average developer to use, are much cheaper, right? Um, and and in some ways more flexible because you can you can wrap the data to many different solutions, and then you can use like a query engine like Presto or Dremio on top of multiple data stores as a single point, right? And I think I think that's probably I, I imagine the larger studios, you know. I think a lot of studios will start on Snowflake, but sort of will, will, will probably reach the limits of that as they start collecting more and more data. And so I think it'll be it'll be interesting to watch um, because there's definitely there's definitely a tax. Like the more you use the data, the more you the bill you goes up. But it's in the beginning you're not using the data, so you're like, oh, this is the same as same cost of storing it, like you know, in in in, in regular storage. So it's 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 actually a pretty brilliant business model they have. So in Databricks, um, they recently released uh, a whole new sweep of services for SQL Interactive, right? And again, it's like the, I, I can already see through, you know, there's a, definitely a balance between cost and, and performance. And it's like, it's the, no one's gonna have the, think this, the, the best solution. And yeah, I think a lot of it also has to do with accuracy. How accurate do you want to be? Which I was going to actually ask you, Oliver, since you were more in like the gaming development side, like what happened to like Amplitude and these other analytics services that just do analytics? Because ultimately Snowflake is for analytics, right? That's what it's meant for. So why not use a service dedicated for gaming analytics? Yeah, I think like it depends on, on the company size and, and what you want to do with the data. So I think like 
in the beginning, it's, it's probably good to use like, um, if you're a small developer, use like some third party or such services like Amplitude, but also some free ones and so on. Uh, get your KPIs, know your game and so on. Um, but as soon as you start growing and you want to dig deeper into the data, you want to have like the flexibility to do the queries you want to, to make, or if you want to um, basically control like how are KPIs defined and so on. Sometimes it's not very transparent how these tools are defining KPIs or calculate them and so on. There can be things going wrong um, on their side as well where you don't have the insights done. And at some point, at least that was, was the case of Colibri Games was like that we wanted to be in control of the data. So with Amplitude, we didn't have like really like the, the control and we couldn't do all the things. And of course you can maybe have some APIs and so on. But I think like what's what's what I see more recently and more 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 coming up is like that the game developers or publishers are kind of owning the data and then their applications on top which use the data. Like for example, like putting everything into Snowflake or uh, uh, plop storage or like a um, uh, data lake and then their applications are kind of reading from that um, data and then you can get like certain information out of there and, and, and or services out of there, but you are still owning the data. And if you want to use that tool and, and another tool and the three, four tools, it gets much easier if you are kind of in control of the data instead of like putting everything just into one SAS tool and then it's kind of locked, locked in there. So maybe we could talk about, to your point, Oliver, you're saying that the size of the company matters. And so maybe from the perspective of small company, mid-sized company to large company or publisher, maybe we could talk about what a best-in-class tech stack or data stack would look like. So you mentioned on the small side, you probably just use a third party. So whether it's Amplitude, Mixed Panel, Lean Plum, something like that. Do you guys have any thoughts or recommendations that you guys would make? Is it I, I'm a fan of Amplitude as well, but is, are there any other thoughts in terms of specific vendors for maybe folks in the audience who are thinking about considering some types of solutions, just talking about the small company for, for now? Yes. Yeah, I think you named a lot of them. I think it depends like on what, what you want to achieve, like um, what are the use cases for your data? So of course, like yeah. Lean Plum, if you want to go more into personalization, CRM, A-B testing maybe um, is, is a good tool. Then there are tools which are more just focus on, on in KPIs and dashboards. You can easily build, build some dashboards, even tools to, to build predictions. There is the whole uh, marketing um, MMP tools where you um, like Apps Flyer and, and Adjust and Singular and so on, where you can just like um, um, put your data in and get like the attribution on, on top of it. Um, so I think like that depends like what, what are your use cases, what you want to do with the data. Uh, but if you're very small, I would rather try to combine certain tools uh, and, and so on. And then uh, only later, like they see like maybe some shortcomings or if you want to have more flexibility, um, then right. kind of start in, to invest in your own data warehouse or um, maybe a mix, mix of like the tools in a data warehouse or something like that. Right. And so on the small side, third party, you're a little bit kind of fixed in terms of templated ways of seeing things, things like that. On the For the mid-size companies, so you've got a game or several games, you're starting to achieve scale, like a common data stack that I've seen is like Firebase for telemetry and then like a Google BigQuery for your, for your data warehouse. And then for visualization, like a SQL-based approach, like a Periscope or a Mode or something like that. For, but for mid-sized companies in terms of a recommended data stack, do you guys have any thoughts in terms of the mid-sized company? I mean, I was going to actually Anything? suggest exactly oh. what you just said. Um, okay. Because it, it gives you the best of both worlds. It, they do have, you know, push notifications, player profiles. They have, um, you can do everything you can do in Lean Plum, basically, in, Red, in Firebase. And you can also, my, you have BigQuery, as you said, as well. All the data is stored in a pretty decent, fast database. And um, even going further, I mean, they have Data Studio, which is not bad and it's free. And they also acquired Looker, which works beautifully with BigQuery. So I think that's kind of like the cutting edge where you don't need to hire more engineers. Um, I think the gap is yeah, up to here. You can do it with you know, a full stack person. 
And then there's the big jump of, okay, hiring people that have no interest in Unity and they're strictly gonna be just working on data. You, that, that, that I think architecture makes sense. I mean, BigQuery, Snowflake, whatever it may be, plus some bad tool for analytics. I think on the, a lot of these gaming companies also start, they, they, they need to have an observability stack, right? Especially as they're launching or they're scaling. So they probably have to couple that with, you know, a set of observability tools, you know, on the logging side, that could be Splunk or Elastic. On the on the uh, tracing side, that could be something like you know New Relic or App Dynamics, or you could use something like Datadog, which covers it all. A lot of these companies are starting to want to use multiple products, right? Because none of those products are really good at a single one thing. That's actually, by the way, where Grafana comes in, right? Uh, while Grafana Grafana has its own back, you can use backends like Prometheus or a time series database that can sit on top of multiple observability products and sort of bring it all together. So that's, uh, it, it feels like one product in the end to the, to the, the, the folks, you know, who are, who are running operations, the SREs, but, um, you know, typically I think the analytics stack would be then complemented by, uh, by this sort of observability stack. I'm curious what you guys, uh, use at your, your companies to do that stuff. Well, I think the, the the difference is almost, do you have a backend server, right? So a lot of Tilting Point games have no backend server. Wow. So our observability happens on the data ingestion side. Got it. Um, and then, yeah, we, like, we do have Grafana and Prometheus and, and, um, and Grafana, the other one that you mentioned as well, um, for logs. And, uh, and, that, and that's a perfect solution. But in the, in the gaming side, I think... That's also a big difference between small studio and mid-size or large studio is a backend. I have no idea if if you Oliver how much of a backend like analytics there was. Yeah. Um, so so with Colibri, they also like um, never built their own backend. There are tools for that as well nowadays, like Playfab, for example. Uh, Firebase, I think, could also be considered as a as a backend. Yeah. Um, so I think for, for a lot of casual, not multiplayer games, there, there's no need of backend. And then you often start like um, sending events directly to any, yeah, any, any service which can consume that directly without needing to go to a backend uh, first and then get the data out of the backend again. So um, yeah, I think like for, for at least like the, the, the more casual mobile games, uh, that's, that's more and more often the case. Yeah, and then maybe finally going getting to the large company or the big publisher, I think things become a lot more complicated. And maybe just to characterize the problem for the audience, one of the issues, for example, is that you might have a large portfolio of games. And I think, Oliver, you kind of touched upon this before in terms of like standardization, right? So you want retention that you're seeing for game one to be the same as game five, six, seven, eight, nine, so forth. And so like some of the issues that I've seen, for example, has just been when you've got a large portfolio of games and you have an approach before where, you know, you might be just storing data is coming in, you're just kind of storing it in JSON blobs. And then when it comes time to create a, a view, a dashboard of some kind, then you, you can have to kind of manually go and create these views rather than having like a like predefined event spec such, such that, you know, all of the games are sending a very standardized view uh, in terms of the telemetry. And, and th so, so the way that it's, it's stored and visualized is, is a lot, right? And so what I found is that there's a difference between having that approach where you can get, you can bring a new game online and get the visualization in less than a day versus like, hey, wh when are we gonna get, when am, when am I going to get visibility on some of these games? It's taking forever because they're just storing a bunch of crap, right, in, in, the, in, in the data warehouse. And then later it's like, okay, we need this view. And then they just kind of try and custom do that. But with Snowflake or with other technologies, is, is that easier to solve this problem? And what kind of data infrastructure, given that kind of a situation, would you guys recommend for like a bigger company at higher scale or across lots of titles? 
Yeah, I think like there, there's actually not so many tools out there which which help you support like the semantics of the data. Like what you send is still like in the control of the game and so on and so forth. You can have like standardization, but uh, in the end, if a game implements like a certain event a little bit different um, than, than the other game or triggers it only if, if, if like something slightly different happens, like that's, that's something like no tool can really help you. Uh, that's something you need to then then observe. There, there are some advances is really uh, lately. Um, something that you mentioned, uh, Andre, like Monte Carlo, where you can basically better get an idea of 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 your data and what you're getting. What's the data quality? Um, uh, what are the values um, in for certain fields and so on? And you can better understand if some something goes wrong. But like kind of defining the semantics um, of 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 the data and, and making sure that everything is, is on the same level. I think there's not yet uh, so much uh, support, but that is, that's, I think, like the most domain specific things uh, where, where infrastructure can't help you that much because like it's up to you, like how you define your, your data and, and what the data is you, you send to these, these infrastructures. Yeah, I mean, at Tilting Point, we, we made it this, the switch about a year ago, I would say, to being more mature about data. Um, so we used to be like three years ago, we were all Python notebooks uh, doing ETL jobs and just gluing data together in whatever way we could. Um, and then about a year ago, we decided to completely redo everything, thinking about it in, the, in like, how do big boys do it? Um, and what that <laughs> means is that, well, we switched from Python to Scala um, because we realized that you need to have typing in, in the data. Uh, and the code, because otherwise a JSON blob that has, you know, number of levels one, one day is a float and tomorrow it's a string. And then you only figure that out when uh, the, the query doesn't work. Um, so typing was, was really big for us. Um, and then on the other side, like uh, before Monte Carlo was around, like we'd started working on all the, the data quality uh, tooling that we needed, right? Are we getting the same number of events? Um, from day to day and, and things like that. And there's also tools like, um, like from a data science side that I hope become more popular in general. It's like H2O, um, because a lot of tools are, out there exist for creating data sets from, for data scientists. But the same tool that allows you to make a data set to analyze like, am I getting a good sample of data is actually pretty decent for understanding data quality. Um, and, and so that's neat. Um, so yeah, we totally switch our entire ETL. The other part is that we very much strongly believe in um, multi-hop infrastructure, meaning that you know we, we work on a three levels of data quality. The first level is the bronze level, which is just the raw data. And it could be just garbage that we get from an API. We don't know what it is. Then there is a silver level that is clean, uh, cleaner. Uh, that we start to combine things together. And then there's the gold. The gold is the one that we give to the stakeholders or the game managers. And by doing so and putting data quality uh, requirements on each step, um, the gold is, is pristine. And that's, that, that philosophy and us redoing all of our infrastructure has like totally changed how we, how we see data and the data quality and the data trust that we have in the company. That said, it's a lot of work. Uh, it is a lot of work to do this. Okay, and maybe one other question I could ask is around this kind of dynamic, this balance between cost and data fidelity, quality, things like what if, right? Like, and so for a lot of, especially mobile free to play games, it, to some degree, especially for, for some games where you're really looking at margin and you want to reduce the cost of your data infrastructure, you might have a budget in terms of, hey, we want to get under you know, 15 uh, events per DAO or something like that. Um, and, and you want to be really efficient in terms of your data versus, hey, we're just going to store as much as possible because we don't know what we might need to learn later. And so some of the things I've seen before are some games that just store a massive amount of data and then no one ever looks at it. <laughs> but but I, it, do you guys have any thoughts in terms of managing for cost versus managing for a lot of data and 
for the unknown case of what may happen in the future. And we might want to go back and try and, and look at some of the data later. How, how do you guys manage that? Or how do you guys think about that? Yeah, so so, so I'm, I'm not such a big fan of like pump all the data in and dump it. And maybe we, we can use it at some point <laughs> yeah. because uh, because the, the data will, will kind of rot. If, if nobody looks at it, nobody knows if it's yeah. correct. There, there will always be some problems, um, either like um, in a new game update, maybe a trigger is not set correctly or um, something goes wrong on the way. Maybe you, you just find out if you look really deep that there are certain problems and how you send the event or, or certain fields and so on. So I think like if you're not using the data immediately and and also like in a way where people look at it on a regular fashion, I think the data is almost uh, useless. So I think um, therefore you should really just find out like what's the data and what do you want to do with the data, um, and then and then only send this data to 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 um, yeah to 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 the warehouse and and look at it. So every time uh, I, I saw people doing this like hey we could need this at some point i never saw like uh, that it was working out that we had, at a certain stage can say like okay we collected that data one year ago let's look at it uh, because it was often like very very fraudulent and, and a lot of things happened there so i think like uh, on that side i think you should find out like what are what is the data which is like valuable for you try to send it and send that data um on the cost side maybe they're Oftentimes, you can also like batch certain things together in order to not send too many events. But actually, I think like nowadays, if you invest in in a data infrastructure, I think if you have like ten events per DAO or twenty events per DAO, that doesn't make like the big cost increases anymore because you have also like the cost of like a team working on it um, and so on and so forth. So I think like um, it's it's not only about the infrastructure but also like about the team. Um, so I think there's not so many limiting factors anymore in like how much events you want to send and storage is very cheap. Um, computation um, can also be scaled up or down or only used on, 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 on certain areas and certain data. Um, so I think that that become much better in, in the recent years. Andrea, tilting point, is there any kind of benchmark or KPI that you guys look at with respect to data cost? For, for a game or is it just like this because you have kind of a standardized infrastructure you guys it's just like a typical cost of doing business so we actually have two different ways of doing analytics uh, which goes into kind of what Oliver said like if there's data rot so we made the decision a while back to, to give the game developers the freedom to do whatever they wanted with analytics uh, and not have the okay. data team be the, the limiting factor. Because ultimately, the more structure you put into data, the more the data team has to be participate in the development of the game. And we didn't feel like we should be the, the, gap, the, the stopper. Uh, but we do still also have a legacy uh, analytics system. And actually, the way we operate this legacy analytics system is that it's uh, basically our monitoring and logging in many ways. So. It, is there rot in that data? I'm sure there is. But whenever there is a bug in the main uh, analytics system, we have a second source of truth that we can ingest, but only ingest once we need it, right? We don't have to be you know, paying all the costs from aggregating the data and analyzing the data every day. It's just on when there is a problem, then we can load the data for a specific set of days and see what it's like, and then figure out if it's roughly correct or wrong. Um, as far as like cost of data, I don't think, I mean, from a, from a bottom line, from like the central to, you know, perspective, yeah, holy crap, we spend a lot of data in analytics. Um, at the same time, it's, it's split between games and the games should make their own decisions about how much events they need. The only thing that I've seen that is still a huge bummer, and I think this is to, um, to Gaurav's, uh, you know, using Grafana and monitoring is uh, early on in the game development cycle, you have the problem of knowing how, how much time is my player spending in the game? And I've just improved the, the frame rate. Did that improve the, the time in the game? And that's a super expensive event to measure, right? Because that's a heartbeat. And if you try to do that with traditional data uh, systems, that, that's cost prohibitively expensive. At the same time, I actually don't know if there's any developer that switches uh, solutions uh, to something like Grafana, 
some real time event uh, time series database to do this kind of thing. And then Gaurav, you had mentioned that with Snowflake, it's now super cheap to kind of store data, but then when you query or transform the data within Snowflake, it yeah. becomes super expensive. So is that like, is, is the current state of the art where you can potentially store more than you would before, but then like once you actually try to do something with it, it costs a lot? Yeah, I mean, you typically don't know what it's gonna cost you until you start using it. So, so, so you know, uh, Generally, you're collecting all this telemetry. Some of it is for operational purposes, like heartbeats, you know, other kind of monitoring metrics, just to, 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 to evaluate uptime. Those are typically probably some period of time is going into a, a observability tool, like a logging tool. Call it last seven days or last 30 days. Typically, you take all the data as much as you can and you store it in there because it's worth it. Because if your game is down, you're you're happy that you had the data to go and troubleshoot that. Because if you don't, if you're not collecting that data in the first place, you you, you know you, you can do the ROI calculation there pretty easily. And then if you do want to store a, a longer period of data as a backup, then you would sort of take data after it sort of expired out from that seven day period or thirty day period, and put it into some sort of slower, longer term storage, which could be like S3 blob storage, et cetera, right? And then if you ever needed to get that to do for some, maybe some compliance reason, or maybe you had, you, you, you had a failure somewhere, then you could kind of rehydrate it in one of your observability tools. So I think that's how, especially the, the mid-sized to large-sized gaming companies manage the cost for that stuff. Then there's the analytics side. And I think their developers are just being much more purposeful about what data to collect and what kinds of analytics they're doing, right? For, 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 for the reasons I mentioned, right? You know, one, like if the data, if it's a data swamp, then it's not useful and it's a mess, right? So you, you do want to make sure you're, you're, you're taking that analytics data and it's consumable by people. And so I think there's that two sides of that. There's the operational side and there's the analytics side. So I think that's how people tend to control, um, there's snowflake costs, right? They're more purposeful about it, but more and more people are, are, are actually trying to push like as much data over there as possible, right? And so that's a little bit of, it'll just be interesting to see what happens, right? And and whether people start to then think about other architectures longer term if they get, if they fall into that trap. But right now, I don't think, I, I don't hear too many people saying that data cost is the issue because they, they, they have a retention policies for different kinds of data. Well, I think we're almost out of time. I actually have a lot of other questions, but uh, maybe we could just uh, wrap it up here. And if you guys have a final message for our audience or maybe a bit of advice when it comes to some of the game studios out there that are thinking about setting up their own data infrastructure, if you have any final message and maybe starting with you, Andre. Yeah, I mean, I think to, to pick up from where Oliver kind of mentioned, I mean, data quality is ultimately the 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 biggest challenge it's not the cost i mean and the inf the the stack is interesting it, it, you have to make the right decisions but at the end of the day um it all comes down to if, it, if is it any good um and that's right. still kind of something that game companies are still struggling to find who who owns that um is that the 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 unity developer is that the qa person is that the data team who who is the one responsible for that quality and uh yeah Keep an eye on it. Okay, right. Gaurav? Yeah, I think I think data, uh, both the analytics side and the observability side is an afterthought, right? Unfortunately, because you're trying to get the game built. And <laughs> I mean, to the, to the degree, like you can make your life a lot easier if you plan this stuff up front. It, 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 you know, it's whether it's just coming up with a set of standards and schemas, uh, for those various things and, and just have a plan to, of where you want to put the data and, and what kind of tools you want to use. It, it's going to make your life a lot easier. Okay. And Oliver? Yeah. Yeah. Also, I think like uh, what, what, uh, was, um, what uh, Andre and Graf said uh, is very true, but I think there's also like another another point which which is also very important. It's like you can have like the best tech and infrastructure and so on. You need to make 
people use the data and kind of establish like a culture. And I think that's also like a very big challenge. And sometimes I think that's even like the bigger challenge than the infrastructure challenges you have. So not just focusing on, on the infrastructure side, I think it's important, but also like make sure that the people use the data that we can, uh, that uh, the company gets value out of the data. And it's not just like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Got it. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for your time. That is it. Thanks to our audience. Until next time, catch y'all later. Bye.